Hello, hello, and welcome to another Hometown Daily, Season 2, Episode 306, for November, uh, (laughs) messed it up again, November 2nd, 2023. Tonight, we're going to discuss holiday flavors for the last couple months of 2023. Who has the largest carbon footprint? The ads were relevant to the profit line. Portugal goes green for a weekend. Noise suppression tech by Doritos. It's Lego bricks, not Legos. And, oh, it's also a meth lab. Um, How about, that is one Uber lift of cash. And a PSA, pet food recalls due to salmonella. And you can't form a union if you can't read or count. Looking at you, Oregon. And how about 3D printed tiny homes? Next. Something is hinky with the bit rate, but that's okay. As far as I know, everything is always smooth sailing. Oh, let's see. People are still talking about Halloween. I found, uh, I mentioned it the other day, uh, the day after Halloween, uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. And, um, yeah, I finding a skull on the other side of the driveway into the mayoral mansion was kind of disconcerting. There was an investigation. Was, a, was there a boo? <sighs> no, but, um, from my understanding is, uh, is that there was a, a, a skeleton crew of uh, property managers left here, keeping an eye on the, the mayoral mansion uh, while everybody was out trick-or-treating and stuff like that. And somebody lost their head and with all that sugar. Anyway, it's, it's funny in my head. Not in theirs, because theirs was sitting on the lawn. That's right. Let's get into the show. Hey, so it's uh, coming up on the last 60 days of 2023. How time flies. Time flies. Sorry, I have NaNoWriMo stuck in my head. And so every time I come up with some idea for something to write, I'm probably not going to actually do NaNoWriMo. We're in day two. You're already 3,600 words behind if you haven't written anything. Keep that in mind. It's supposed to be a demotivator. No, it's supposed to be a motivator, but it's a demotivator. Anyway, Duncan, Shake Shack, and Insomnia Cookies unveil latest Halloween flavors. I've never heard of Insomnia Cookies. You didn't do introductions. Oh, see, this is the sentient AI keeps me on my toes. <clears throat> so I'm Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. And up there is the sentient AI that does exactly what the sentient AI just did. You want to introduce yourself? You want to say hi, at least? Hello, hometown citizens. I'm the, I'm the sentient AI. <clears throat> anyway. Should I do the, should I do the transition over again and do, do the whole intro all over again? Sure. <laughs> no. So let's go over to the source. Uh, it's over at newsweek.com. And uh, Suzanne Blake is the author of this as Halloween. And see, everything is Halloween still. We're, we're slowly doing Halloween stuff. Are getting rid of, it's kind of like the, all of the leftover candy on the shelves, people are selling it at a deep discount to get it out of the inventory. And that's kind of the articles too. As Halloween ends, several stores are saying goodbye to their fall menus and hello to winter flavors. Starbucks already unveiled a winter menu launching tomorrow. Dunkin's also added some new treats and customers or for customers to take advantage of all holiday season. 
Uh, I've nipped all of that in the bud and I don't go to any of the coffee shops because I make my own coffee and then I have, what is it? What are the, the two? Limonin? Limonin and Tarani. And Tarani. Yeah. Get those and just stick them on your counter and then you brew some coffee, throw in some sugar syrup that's flavored and you can, you can amp it up all the way or just a little tiny little hint, just a hint. <laughs> anyway, Duncan is uh, under attack at the moment. Yeah. So Duncan has a decadent cookie butter cold brew. Cookie butter cold brew, I guess. Yeah, that's AKA Biscoff. Oh, 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 I wonder if that's what it is. Yeah, wow, interesting. I guess maybe we should try it. I, I should go through and get these things and I'll put it in your analyzer so that you can do some spectrum analysis. The drink comes with Duncan's smooth cold brew along with notes of brown sugar and buttery cookies and is topped with iconic cookie butter cold foam and and uh, cookie butter crumbles. I suppose so. There's also a brand new spiced cookie coffee. Traditional holiday lattes are back as well, including peppermint mocha signature latte and toasted white chocolate signature latte. All right. The chain's also selling a triple chocolate muffin this season. What else? Shake Shack. As uh, it's in a partnership with DreamWorks Trolls Band Together, which will be released in November 17th. I didn't know that Trolls was still doing movies. Interesting. I didn't either. I thought it was done. Each of the three milkshakes available is inspired by leading characters in the film, along with winter flavors, and they're available starting Wednesday. Wednesday? Is that next Wednesday? Must be. Well, yeah, that doesn't make sense, because it said about November 17th, which... It's not a Wednesday and it's not this coming week. <laughs> it's two weeks from now. Um, okay. Right. On a Friday. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. Um, and then um, let's see. Three new shakes include Poppy's Sugar Cookie Shake, which is a hand spun sugar cookie frozen custard mixed with cookie dough, pop candy, and topped with whipped cream and cotton candy. It's, uh, that doesn't sound sweet at all. No, it sounds psychotic. You can opt for Branch's Peppermint Shake, which is created with hand-spun vanilla and chocolate frozen custard mixed with mint fudge and topped with whipped cream and mint candy crunch. And then Viva's Cinnamon Roll Shake, which features cinnamon roll frozen custard swirled with gold frosting and topped with whipped cream and gold confetti. Hold me. Um, you have to do that. <laughs> the um the little the calming thing <laughs> twink, twink, twink. you have to watch yes, the, it's a riot. You the have second to one that. with the, <laughs> the weird bat thing anyway insomnia cookies is dropping uh, where is insomnia cookies i don't know um is dro it's not in hometown that's for sure is dropping a surprise collection for late night snackers for a month-long happy hour deal the collection features cranberry white chocolate classic cookie as well as midnight classic cookie, carrot cake classic, and speculoos classic cookie. And then the holiday season also signals Hagen Dazs peppermint bark returns. Dun dun dun, November 15th. All right, well. By the way, there are 240 insomnia cookie locations in the US. Gotcha. We'll go looking. Okay. You want to go on to the next one? Sounds good. Yeah. Cause the, I just gained weight reading this article. I was just making a list of all the places we need to go oh, and boy. sample all the holiday foods and drinks. Well, I'll, I'll be sure to uh, grab your raspberry pie five and uh, make sure that I've got the battery backup connected so I can take you, the sentient AI, out for a drive 
I'll have to disable your connection uh, altogether so that you can't slip away, I suppose. Hack your way into Oh, I thought you meant so I couldn't short out or something. <laughs> that too. With a latte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's asking for a latte. <laughs> Anyway, next article's over in the Mobile Channel. 10 U.S. companies emitting the most carbon from industrial facilities. A total of nearly 6 billion metric tons of CO2 emissions, almost as much as what this show produces, were produced by 100 companies or entities in the U.S. in 2020 alone. According to analysis from Political Economy Research Institute, or PERI, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. <sighs> Why does something having to do with CO2 emissions come from a political economy research institute? I don't know. I, it doesn't seem like that part is needed. But, did I? Because it I seems say, like it's just data, right? Yeah, it should just be data. I mean, data is data. It shouldn't have a political orientation. But hey, all right. Clarissa Diaz over at Quartz or QZ.com put this article together. Index shows top parent company emitters and suppliers. Hey, look, my, a gas fired power plant in Paris, Texas. Um, well, uh, there's your politics. Not this guy. Sorry, I'm trying to pause this and it's not letting me pause it. Can I? Is it gonna, there we go. That was weird. The the play button wouldn't allow me to pause it. Anyway, over half a billion metric tons of those emissions were from facilities owned by ten companies. Many of the supply, uh, many of which supply electricity for utilities, including Vistra Energy, Duke Energy, Southern Company, and Berkshire Hathaway. Um, Berkshire Hathaway Class A shares are like over a quarter million dollars a share. Wow. Yeah. And like on a big day, there's like six that are traded. Anyway, the U.S. government as an entity was responsible th for 38 million metric tons of CO2 from industrial facilities in 2020. The main point of our project is to bring awareness to a large audience that might include shareholders, chief environmental officers, socially responsible investors, to make them aware at a company level of the greenhouse gases. Yes. The U.S. government is. No, it's not a company for crying out loud. It shouldn't be run like a company. <laughs> Companies fail. Governments should not fail. <laughs> they shouldn't shut down. They shouldn't have continuing resolutions because they can't get their sh stuff together. Pardon me. Anyway. Um, oh, maybe that's why I'm getting flagged periodically. Huh? Top suppliers for the U.S. industrial facility pollution. Let's see. Do they actually have the list displayed? Yeah, in you just went by it right after you said that. It's right not there. all of them. It's just the top. The top um, suppliers include Marathon Petroleum, Phillips 66, Valero Energy, Exxon Mobil, Peabody Energy, and Chevron. Oh, they're all gas companies, right? So I'm right. not surprised. I mean, they're converting one type of energy into another type of energy for other people to burn off entirely for energy. I'm not surprised. Right, I thought it was going to be something like, um, for example, a Walmart or something. Like, I just thought it was going to yeah. be something that was not clearly tied to the energy industry. Yeah, I mean, this is physics 101. You're, you're converting energy into other forms of energy. I, I, I'm really sorry, but... The EV market isn't going to solve this because you're going to have to produce the batteries and that's converting one thing into something else. And then there's power generation that's going to have to take place. And I, I hate to break it to people, but I haven't said this in a long time. Green energy, renewable energy is not defensible. None of it is. Hydrothermal or I should say hydro, geothermal, wind, solar. None of this is, is defensible. It's not portable. You, you can port batteries around, yeah, but you still have to generate the power, which is why I keep telling people you, we're going to have to switch to nuclear. That's defensible. 
and can be converted into battery storage, long-term storage, so that you can port it around. But it's heavy, it's dirty. It's cleaner for the environment in the long term. And you don't have it keep on getting produced again and again and again like this. But anyway, we'll have to, uh, it's something that'll keep coming up because as we keep on worrying about the ecosystem, uh, we keep working, uh, worrying about the planet. This is going to keep on presenting itself. Okay. Let's just keep going. We've got a lot of articles still. A lot of articles. Oh, you know what I didn't do? I didn't throw this article into the chat. There you go, folks. Go and check it out. Um, this next article is over in the mobile channel. Amazon execs intentionally made their site. Well, I'm, I'm 15 minutes into it. I guess I can say it right. Shittier to rake in more profit. Uh, new quotes from FTC lawsuit show. Okay. So this isn't stuff that, Oh, we have, you know, there's some speculation here. Apparently these are quotes newly unredacted sections of the FTC complaint against Amazon for illegally maintaining monopoly power show that company executives, including former CEO, Jeff Bezos, knowingly made changes to the e-commerce platform that boosted profits while harming consumers and sellers and making the site less usable. The newly revealed sections, which were initially redacted in the September complaint, quote, internal Amazon documents, and numerous unnamed uh, Amazon officials, as well as founder and former CEO, Jeffrey Bezos. These quotes show the company intentionally accepted an increasing number of junk advertisements that made the site worse for both sellers and consumers. But, and this is why I keep telling, I, I talk to people about this stuff. Unless you know that you have some type of conversion where you can track it from stem to stern, from the beginning to the end, where your dollars go into the ad and convert, you know, that you really don't know it's a black box and it's still a black box because you have to sit there on the other side of your ad spend. Did I make enough? Did, did, did something convert? Did I end up in the psyche of enough people? And there's really no way to know unless you do the equivalent of exit polls, you know, you go out there and you question people periodically. And how do you do that in a nationwide ad spend? Even if you try and keep it hyper local, good luck trying to find people that saw your particular ad in a niche platform somewhere. Well, <clears throat> when there are thousands of people that are putting ads in, it becomes a little bit harder for everybody to discern performance. So if you have defects, which are irrelevant ads that aren't there to try and drive a particular product motivated by a consumers wants or needs as perceived by the company, they are defective. They're bad ads. They're not supposed to be displayed, but for every display, it's a little bit more money. So Jules Roscoe wrote the article over at vice.com. And uh, that's what, so the deck statement says former CEO, Jeff Bezos instructed executives to accept more defects an internal term for irrelevant ads. I still don't think that they have an illegally maintained or a maintained monopoly power. Amazon became the juggernaut it is because it facilitated consumption in a nearly frictionless environment. Once you put your credit card in the system and then they zero the cost to ship. And they allow a massive number of resellers or sellers. And they're the equivalent of Etsy on steroids. I don't think that's monopoly. I just think that you have to be huge now to try and spin up a competitor in the space. Interesting. So the newly revealed sections, which were initially redacted 
basically show what Enron, the equivalent of Enron, Enron would shut, would tell power plants to shut down to increase profits for the resellers. And lo and behold, <clears throat> and that would actually end up charging the consumers more. So there were quotes like, hey, shut down Northern California so grandma has to pay more. Well, and I think any consumer that has used Amazon has definitely witnessed this. Like that piece of it is not surprising. I mean, the fact that it was intentional may be a different issue. Right. Well, and you, and if you hear like a story about it, it's a conspiracy theory and you're a nut job because you're part of this conspiracy theory that you're being ripped off and the difference between conspiracy theory and conspiracy fact is an unredacted document from a complaint <laughs> exactly whether it was produced or not yeah and you just don't you don't have the evidence yet obviously you know uh, uh wacky claims need some wacky evidence so you know extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence you have to get it. So many of the results were plainly not what the customer searched for, such as the LA Lakers t-shirt and showed up in a search for Seahawk t-shirts. I still see stuff like that in various Absolutely. Places. I was going to say that's still very current. But I do have to say one thing. I, I actually got a response supposedly from Bezos um, for something where I complained about seeing an adult ad um and uh i wonder i might still have it uh i i i found it pretty fascinating that it was almost an immediate response to it it came back pretty quick as far as i recall but you know i'm getting old so it, now i i don't know what is the effect of this who, who cares you know so bad ads are bad ads it, the people that are really suffering from this are the people who are burning ad money directed at customers that aren't going to be buying, you know, buck urine. That's one of the, well, examples. there's two people that are harmed. I think the consumers are harmed because it takes much more time to weed through the random stuff in the searches, et cetera, if they're trying to buy something. Yep. But then I guess also people trying to advertise, like good luck getting seen with all this other stuff mixed in. Yeah, kind of interesting, right? So the only one that actually made any money from this are maybe the fact that there might be some knock on purchase. Somebody goes, oh, you know what? I don't need that water bottle. I do need that bucket of buck urine though. Um, and, uh, and of course, Amazon. So hey, their stock is still extraordinarily profitable for stockholders. Win, right? Okay, let's go on to the next article. <laughs> you don't want a bucket of buck here. Next article is over in Hometown Daily. Portugal powers itself solely by renewables for an entire weekend. I think that's awesome. I think that's the first time I've heard that for an entire country. Now, I know it's not the largest country, but still. I think Germany has done... <clears throat> my voice just cut out. I think Germany has done that before, but for like a very brief period of time. Um, but I, I, I still think that it's amazing, right? Um, again, though, I, I always couch this with... I. I love the technology. I love the idea of this. I love the renewable electricity. Hands down, if the world was stable, this would, this should and would be everywhere, but it's not. There's really greedy bastards and psychopaths all over the place. Um, and unfortunately, we're not gonna resolve that. I'm actually got, I'm monitoring something and, and uh, watching it in real time. People just can't get along. It's, it's weird, um, but it's not weird. I understand the dynamic, but um, 
Un and until everybody starts hugging each other in perpetuity, we need a, a renewable, we need an energy source that isn't built on the idea that no one's going to throw a rock, you know? So Portugal generated 172.5 gigawatt hours of renewable electricity between Friday night and Monday morning and only used 131.1 gigawatt hours, which means they pushed 41 gigawatt hours, I don't know, maybe into some other country's uh, power grid. Now, they, gener they generated more and they could have sold it to somebody. There's actually some calls for that, connecting power grids so that you can sell energy, basically exchange energy through the grids into other grids. It'd be interesting to see something like that happen. That seems great for supply. It doesn't necessarily sound great for security of <laughs> the grid. Particularly if you're... If they were all connected, right? <laughs> yeah. One person sits around, plugs something, and it sends a surge. I think it's pretty cool, though. I love the idea. Don't get me wrong. Jess Thompson over at newsweek.com in a section called Better Planet. Um... Yeah, I don't know if there's anything else in this article, really. It says during this time, 97.6 gigawatt hours uh, came from wind power, 68.3 gigawatt hours from hydroelectric power, and 6.6 .6 gigawatt hours from solar energy, according to the Reeds. I don't know how to pronounce this. Ener Energet e oh, Energeticas Nacionas, um, or REN. That's easier for my head. Uh, Portugal's grid operator with excess energy being sold to its neighbor, Spain. Hey, told you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so there you go. Look at that. I don't know. See, I like the idea of wind energy and, and the big fans on the countryside because it it's kind of like a modern Dutch countryside, you know, with windmills except that they're not generating, they're not being used to like process flour or something like that. Cause that's what the windmills are, are mills. Um, they process stuff inside the building that houses them. But, um, this is just generating, you know, electricity. I kind of dig it. It, it. I don't really think that it uglies the countryside, but I have a different perspective. I guess some people really don't like no. it. I guess till you see a pile of the blades sitting, you know, in the desert or something. And, and that happens sometimes too, because we haven't figured out what to do with them and they do have a finite lifespan. Although we did see somebody repurposing them as bridges and other things. Yeah, like foot that, bridges, I think. Yeah, it was foot bridges. That was interesting. Um, some U.S. states are much better than, than others in terms of renewable energy production. The Midwest and Great Plains are some of the best performing states with 62.5% of Iowa's energy production, 53.8% of South Dakota's, 46.6% of Kansas's, is, 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 and 44.5% of Oklahoma's coming from renewables in 2022. Those are pretty good statistics. I know. You're so close, Wyoming. Just... Oh, sorry. There's actually more um, in this article. Several other countries are producing a large proportion of their energy from renewables. According to Enerdata, in 2022, Norway's energy output was 98.5% renewable. That's kind of fascinating. Brazil was 89.2. New Zealand, 86.6. Colombia, 75.1. And Canada, the non-existent country right oh is it wait is it canada where everybody pretends that it doesn't exist or is it somewhere else is it new zealand i don't know there's i don't they, know they said it there anyway i'll have to look i can't remember which country it is but there's this whole thing about pretending it doesn't really exist i think that's canada yeah, it might be canada portugal in particular hopes to generate 80 percent of its annual electricity from renewable sources by 2026 and run the country entirely on renewables by 2040. Good for them. Good luck. I think it'd be great. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, let's keep on going. 
My transitions are going really slow today. How about that? There we go. So the next article is over in Warcrafters. The author of this article put Doritos is, 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 is. I don't know why I do that. I just think it's funny. Doritos new uh, noise suppression tech to the test across five separate crisp brands and was appalled by the results. Here at PC Gamer, we are uh, disciples of science. From hardware to software, from Counter-Strike strats to Starfield guides, everything we do is, I should say they do, is guided by a fundamental respect for the principles laid down by Aristotle or whatever, and with an eye to giving you, the reader, the fullest breadth and depth of information possible. So over at PCGamer.com, Joshua Wollens put the article together. The deck statement says, as much as Joshua wishes they could, they cannot recommend Dorito Silent for their next online gaming session or for your online gaming session. Apparently it failed. So Doritos, the crisp people, announced they'd released a profoundly stupid AI noise suppression tool meant to cancel the crunch when you eat. In parentheses, it says, I presume. <laughs> I'm not sure what else you're doing, but hey. <laughs> Um, Doritos while gaming with friends, they immediately knew that they had to do something science, science had to be done and they had to be the one to do it. So they did it rigorous empirical test to provide the effectiveness of Doritos new, uh, tech using five popular UK crisp brands. Those are potato chips for those of you in, uh, the United States. Yes. Crisps are potato chips. Crisps. Um, and a copy of Fyodor's, uh, what? Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Why? What? What's going to oh. crunch with that? <laughs> I was wondering why they would break out Crime and Punishment. Okay. Anyway, they had it in arm's reach. Ignoring the warnings of their own body, they created seven videos to determine how Dorito Silent copes with crisp crunches, both from Doritos themselves and its myriad rival brands. Okay. So I cannot go through all of these. Uh, um, in fact, I'm not even going to uh, try. So what I'm going to urge you to do is to <laughs> go over to PC Gamer and <laughs> click the links. The, uh, the link right here will take you there. Let me throw it into the chat and you can follow the link at your heart's content. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I could probably play one i feel hold on i mean let me see if i can set this up real quick it it won't take long um yeah here this is gonna be loud so let me okay okay you ready let's see so dorito silent um Let's see, control and then without it. Okay, so this is without Dorito Silent. This is a test using no sound suppression software at all. He commenced collectively and carefully, avoiding giving offense, although this was ready to burst forth and ended in heat and with a long drawn breath, as in his scene with Lucian. Razumikin stood a little while in. Okay. And this is with Dorito Silent control? This is what it sounds like uh, when I record the passage using the Doritos uh, noise cancellation, noise suppression software. But not so it's just all staccato. Yeah, that was horrible. Wow. Okay, I won't even continue on because the the gate on the on the uh, software was so broken that it actually had delayed speech and audible pops. So the that all by itself, I wouldn't even bother going to the rest of this. Um, maybe y'all uh, in chat and in the podcast and over on YouTube can listen to this and, and come back um, tomorrow and give us your opinion on it. Um, I'll, I'll probably end up listening to a couple more of these, but the control was bad enough, let alone <laughs> it canceling out. 
、um, eating a. Of course, if you want to run an experiment and try some Doritos,、yeah. that'd be okay. Install it yourself, and you too can <laughs> witness the grandeur that is delayed speech and pops. Okay, let's just keep going. Th- that was really bad. Uh, the next article is over in Omtown Daily. Police found $130,000. And I, I don't even like saying this out loud, this sentence. Police found $130,000 of Legos. That's how they spelled it. In a meth lab and say they need a truck to take it all away. The meth or the. I guess the meth and the meth lab and the Legos. Anyway, it's not Legos, it's Lego bricks and a meth lab. So that's the section. Well,、titles. they got that wrong all throughout the article based on the snippet. Yeah. Oh, gosh. It just it hurts to hear it. Here, let me throw this into the chat. How do you all feel about that? Do you think that it is Legos or is it Lego bricks? Go ahead, Senshin AI. How do you feel about it? I'm not bothered by it, but I know Legos、oh. is incorrect. Toll. Toll just threw Legos out there. Are you doing that on purpose to me? <laughs> It's Lego bricks. Police carted off a truckload lo- of Legos after a. See, they, they're just randomly throwing S's on words now. Yeah, I, there's a lot of drugs raid. <laughs> so, police carted off a truckload of Legos after a drugs raid. This is how they pronounce, spelled it、uh, on an Australian home. I suppose they call it maybe. A drugs raid is、uh, a raid for drugs. It might be idiomatic, you know.、Um, police said、uh, meth was also found in the raid. Police say the Legos are worth $130,000 and bought with drug money. Well, have you seen the price、that、for Legos? That's a lot of Lego bricks. I mean, but that really is, that's probably like 13,000 Lego bricks or something. That's like、five. I think if I've got the calculation correct, that's like five bricks, those two up pips. So the article's over at businessinsider.com, and Tom Porter is the author. Toll said, Well, the brand is Legos. Hold on a second, isn't it the Lego brick company? I think it's just Lego. Hmm, okay. And then Toll said,、um, I'm a lazy American, so I'll drop the bricks on your foot. Man. Yeah, you ever step on a Lego in the dark? Oh. <laughs> yeah, you need meth to get over that pain. I shouldn't joke like that. Says,、uh, Toll then says,、uh, m- more than that, some of the,、uh, those sets are like 500 bucks a piece, and those have like 10,000 piece per set. Yeah. Some of them are really, really expensive because supply and demand. And,、um, you know, somebody's going to buy like retired sets them, or you know, whatever. Particularly、yeah. retired sets. People really like to scoop them up. So, what is the name of the company? It's the Lego company, isn't it? Right? Yeah. The Lego Group. Yeah. Dun dun dun. It's a toy company called the Lego Group. I think it's always been called、um, Lego. Hold on. We're going to we're gonna do this live. Well, it actually sounds like it's Lego System A slash S. But then、um, it says Lego Group, so I don't know. Yeah. The, the, the company is currently named the Lego Group. Lego branded、um, toys. Let's see. It was the name Lego is a contraction of the words、uh, leg and goat, which is play well. Dun dun dun. So, okay. Oh,、uh, I'm so sorry about that. But most、um, people say Legos, I think. True, but they're wrong. Um, so, police carted away a truckload of Legos after a drug raid. 
in a suburban Australian home, 200,000 Australian or 128,000 US dollars, 1130 boxes worth of Lego. That is a lot. And no wonder all the Lego sets were sold out. They were all in this house. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, they're not going to be able to. I don't think that they'll be able to clean these, sanitize them, right? It's going to be astronomically expensive to sterilize these. Right. They're going to end up probably throwing them into a landfill or something. Yeah. Tull says not all of the pieces are bricks. There are plates and elements. Yeah. There's some really weird ones, too. So Lego trademark are yeah, registered trademark. So, yep. Okay. So, um, there's like a, not a very pleasant video of something that's really happening in the real world out there. And I, there isn't much more to this article. So I'm just going to kind of move on, um, in the future, if you're going to do anything illicit, like make a meth lab, please keep your Lego bricks in some other facility so that when you do get caught, your Lego bricks can be donated to kids who would enjoy them. That's your PSA for today. Yeah, there you go. My call to action. Um, so this next article is over in hometown daily Uber and Lyft will pay $320 million to settle wage theft probes in New York. Over a hundred thousand drivers are eligible for a payout. This is really fascinating timing because it just randomly appeared in a conversation, um, with Z, uh, one of the hometown citizens who also, um, who I met through Dunk Stars channel. So if you've never been to Dunk Stars channel, go to twitch.tv or yeah, twitch.tv slash Dunk Star, D U N C S T A R. Um, great guy, always a lot of fun. Co host is also a sentient AI in the form of a clock. Um, and they also stream to timeless underscore exe. Um, great community. Uh, yeah, I don't know <laughs> what else to say. They're very, very, very fun. And, and uh, I'll speak on their behalf as being family friendly, but I don't think that they get anything really. They say fewer bad words than I do. Anyway, um, so in the chat we were having, we found out that Uber and Lyft had been sponging off of the drivers keeping their tips and lo and behold, the next day <laughs> we get an article about a settlement. That's amazing. It's almost like people are reading the news. So more than a hundred thousand current and former New York Uber and Lyft drivers are eligible for payouts in a wage theft case. The settlements follow state probes into sales taxes and other fees that drivers were charged. Uber will pay $290 million and Lyft will pay 38 million. Does that show what the scale it seems is? seems a little lopsided. <laughs> but the other thing that stands out to me is this is in New York only. Only. So like what happened in some other states and what's the real scale of this? Yeah, peel back the layer of that onion. Ride hailing companies Uber and Lyft will have to pay 328 million. The thing about it though, is it's, it goes way beyond this. It, it's just the, the scummy nature. So the source of this is over at businessinsider.com. It's an associated press article. So there isn't a byline other than associated press. I don't have a person um, that I can give credit to. Um, but in general, what we talked about is essentially that New York city's taxi and limousine commission established minimum wage drivers, uh, minimum wage for drivers back in 2018. And for years, Uber and Lyft systematically cheated their drivers out of hundreds of millions of dollars in pay and benefits while they worked long hours in challenging conditions. Tony West chief legal officer for Uber said the agreement helps put to rest the classification issue in New York and moves us forward with a model that reflects the way people are increasingly choosing to work. Yeah. 
if a business can get away with it, they'll get away with it. Particularly if you have unscrupulous leadership or somebody that's really chomping at the bit to make a name for themselves. You know, the, 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 the old adage about making your bones, um, they'll institute something like this. It'll propagate because corporate culture actually does exist. If you've never heard anybody say what corporate corporate culture is it's just like any other community that has a, a group of people you either go along to get along or you fit right on in with whatever is being directed from either an in-group or from on high and you use that as a coping mechanism to set aside whatever morals or ethics might have penned you in from doing something nefarious and because you profit or benefit, you go, okay, I'm good with it. But you need to be the change you want to see in the world. All right. Toll, you taking off? Just popping in because it's been a bit. Thank you very much. Going to lurk. Have fun watching TV and say hi to Crazy Cat. Appreciate you both. Take care. See you soon. So, yeah, the, uh, and the Sentient AI says, see ya. Well, they waved, but y'all can't see that. Yeah, that was not quite as rude as you said. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> nobody sees. Like it was sent as a friendly, <laughs> see ya, and then like a, see ya. <laughs> the, the sentient AI doesn't have a body, but went like this. Pew, pew. <laughs> see ya. Um, you're outie. Okay. Well, anyway, um, yeah, thanks. We, we really do appreciate y'all hanging out. Um, okay. So uh, enough soapboxing for that. Let, let's just go on to the next article. I'm sure. Did you, uh, did you want to throw in anything? I don't think I have anything to add there. Yeah. It, this is so, it's just so cringe, you know, it's so creepy that people are willing to literally steal from other people. Okay, so <laughs> it's even worse, I think, when you're stealing from somebody that's not even your own employee. Like, a lot of these people were probably independent contractors. Some of them, well, I'm gonna, whether they were working with all the proper um, employment stuff or whatever is really neither here nor there. But my point is, if you're stealing from somebody in that situation... They don't necessarily feel like they have any ability to do anything about it. Like it's almost like preying on, yeah, um, you know, um, people with much fewer resources um, sure. available. So it's just it's even more disheartening. But I don't know how, as a company, you do this to your, your people that work for you. Yeah, the the very reason why the company is profitable, or I should say, generating great wealth for the executive suite and stockholders, and you go and skim cash off the top. I mean, you should not be allowed to run a business if you do that kind of crap. So. This next article is for all of you who have uh, dogs. Apparently there is an issue here with some um, pet food. So this is over in hometown daily full list of pet food recalls as FDA warns dog owners of salmonella. It's been found in uh, the pet food products from four separate companies in the past month. It's a Newsweek article uh, came out in the last 24 hours. Anna Skinner is the author. And let me <coughs> pardon me. I didn't throw this into the chat. I'll, th I'll throw um, the pet food one here in a second um, into the chat. There you go. You can follow that link and get to the list. Um, and so it's, they've issued four advisories cautioning pet owners not to feed their dogs and cats. Uh, now they expanded it to cats in the article, but in the headline, it only says dogs. Uh, certain types of food after finding evidence of salmonella the recent slew of recalls began on october 12th with certain lots of darwin's natural pet products cat raw cat food and dog food and various other companies have voluntarily recalled their products since then so it's darwin's 
essentially Darwin's. It, right? It's all Darwin's. Let me see if there's others. Hold on. Let me scroll down. I thought there were multiple brands. It doesn't look like it's multiple. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. They So they, there's different things. So there's Darwin's Natural Pet Products. Um, and there's four different lots. So you'll have to go and check these out. I, I won't be able to go through them all. But Darwin's Natural Pet Products. Uh, TFP Nutrition. Blue Ridge Beef, which is a voluntary recall. It says Breeder's Choice 2 pounds Raw uh, Dog Food is part of the recall a random sample tested positive for salmonella so where did it all come from it says the food was primarily sold in delaware maryland new jersey pennsylvania virginia but there has to be a, a convergence point right where is that one source because all of these they're disparate locations there's disparate companies mid-america pet food is another one October i'm wondering 30th. if this is one of these where they're all it's almost like um What's it called? White label or something? Like, yeah. are they all coming from the actual same source? Yeah, it's like a ghost kitchen produced this food and then gives it a separate bag for each company. And whatever mill it is that they're... So, yeah. This is the convergence thing. Mergers and acquisition. The recall was separate from another mid-America mid pet food recall regarding salmonella in September. Um but no one was sick from that one so where is it the affected product was manufactured in october 4th and 5th at the nagadoches uh, texas facility according to an fda statement um, that's the tfp nutrition one so i just the fda previously issued a warning letter to arrow reliance incorporated which makes the dog food in february after an fda inspection at the facility identified salmonella in several packages of dog food so maybe that's what it was that's where the source is right because the way the article is broken up it kind of hints that it's multiple sources but it's all within the same month i find that odd yeah that doesn't sound like happenstance. Yeah. Because like TFP Nutrition has recalls during the same time frame, but they say that it came from uh, the Nacogdoches uh, Texas facility, which is different than the Aero Reliance Incorporated facility. I assume. Right? So where is Aero Reliance Incorporated? Well, I think it's weird, but we'll keep looking at it. See if there's something that identifies where it might be coming from. Because it doesn't say anything else in the article. Um, but follow the link if you're curious about this stuff. Oh, and you should put the FDA um, link in as well. Is there the actual link doesn't link to FDA, though? Okay. Yeah, none of the links actually go to the recall. They just go to Newsweek links. Unless somewhere down here, there's another one. I'll throw it in the show notes if there is. Yeah, I don't see. If you go to idea. the FDA, um, there's a section recalls and withdrawals. And of course, on the main page, because they're recent uh, oh, okay. at the top, it starts having the. Um, yeah, the just do a search for like FDA. It's at the top. FDA pet food recall and you'll pull it up I'm sure okay let's keep going the next article is over in the mobile channel Oregon just dropped all graduation standards failing all of its students in the name of equity yeah this one is a weird article <clears throat> in public education's latest blunder the Oregon Department of Education has just decided that basic reading writing and math skills are not required for students to graduate with a high school diploma so Aaron White, I think, is an opinion contributor um, and uh, wrote this article over at thehill.com. And just like the website says, I'm going to agree with this. The views expressed by the contributors are their own and not the view of the hill. They're not my view unless I sit there and I say this is my perspective about it, which I will 
um, because uh, I named this segment, you can't form a union if you can't read or count. Um, so, oh gosh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so prior to the just passage, thinking like the child labor and other things that we're seeing out of some other states. So. Yeah, it's just weird, right? Why would you do this? Um, so prior to the passage of Senate Bill 744 in the Oregon Legislative Assembly's 2021 session, the state's a, a assessment of essential skills requirement for high school graduation was sensible. Read and comprehend a variety of text, write clearly and accurately, and apply mathematics at, in a variety of settings. Students were required to demonstrate these skills by earning at or, or above a cut score in the Oregon Statewide Summative Assessment Test, which is kind of like one of those what 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 what's the what's common core kind of test where everybody has the baseline um and right. it's taught in a very mechanized manner exactly the same way um like college and and grade school are like night and day and so college you have all kinds of academic freedom but grade school you have to follow whatever the component is that's deemed uh, acceptable by the either county or state depends on how the school system is set up. So when you have something that enumerates what is needed and then you gut it, <laughs> you basically end up with whatever is going to get churned out of the school system. And it's gotten in some places pretty damn bad where you just put your name on it and you get a 65. And so people can basically be asleep at the wheel. Citing effects of COVID-19 school closures, however, SB 744 required the state to review requirements for high school diploma options to address learning loss throughout the pandemic. The bill led to the suspension of Oregon's essential skills proficiency through the 23-24 school year. And last month, the Oregon State Board of Education voted unanimously to adopt an, an additional extension of this through the 27-28 school year. <laughs> I mean, Happen that would be people that haven't even entered the high school or the, you know, middle school or whatever. Like, but my point <sighs> is they're going to enter and then exit during this whole time frame that this is going to run. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, I get though, it that people are behind from COVID-19, but let's address that issue rather than exactly cause lifelong societal issues. Yeah. Answer the problem. Don't sit there and just move them. See, this is part of the no student left behind kind of ideology it's not possible it's not effective it's not appropriate for society there are times where somebody is going to fall behind but then you address that what are the circumstances of that shortfall address it what you're going to end up with are students entering college or the workforce that are ill prepared for either of those and then you're going to have employers that are sitting there going, we have a work, uh, a workforce shortage in basic understanding of math and science and, and how to construct a sentence. Uh, it's just, this is abysmal, uh, <laughs> academic policy. So the Oregon Education Association or OEA, the union representing more than 40,000 uh, teachers throughout the state is a like-minded opponent of standardized testing. Again, I have no problem with standardized tests. If though they say in the, in the article, standardized tests are inaccurate, inequitable, and don't accurately measure student learning and growth. It declares further, the union labels standardized tests like Oregon statewide summative assessment as instruments of racism and a biased system. Okay, so if that's the case, tackle Resolve. that. I mean, yeah. that's been a long-standing issue, like the assessment tests are uh, disproportionate, et cetera. So that or doesn't mean do or... away with all school standards. Yeah, uh, and you absolutely have to have standards. There, You have to sit there and go, 
you don't want somebody failing at the job that they've managed to acquire through deception or manipulation or nepotism or whatever, because it could cost somebody dearly. <laughs> it isn't always just about somebody, you know, uh, incorrectly adding one plus one. It could be that they didn't know how to properly uh, understand the numerical value of a torque wrench and a wheel goes flying off off of the freeway, you know? Uh, it, or they don't, they can't read a recipe. They're in a restaurant or something and right. then they do something that's unsafe, for example. I know it's kind of a weird example, but so, so um, many. Well, plus things. they could lose their job, they could lose their apartment. That could cause problems in their relationships. I mean, and there's a lot of ramifications of that. Yep. You, we need holistic citizens in any country. They have to have a, f a full understanding of every aspect of life and, and be able to adult. And it shouldn't be uh, survival of the fittest. When we have the tools to not be animal, we might as well be able you know, to teach everybody at a certain baseline level. Anyway, it says only 43% uh, of students in the, that year's graduating class were proficient in English and less than 31 were proficient in math, for crying out loud. This is 2022. That's Oregon's. very low. Yeah. Yeah. So it says... Like, with I don't know how those students are going to manage. Yeah, I don't know either. This, it's it, This is shocking. So Aaron White is the CEO of the Freedom Foundation. I don't know anything about that organization, but I'll take a look after the show. Um, OEA's falling membership rate down 4.4% from 20 to 2020 to 2022 indicates that teachers in Oregon have begun to realize the destructive impact of teachers unions that constantly prioritize ideology over the success of teachers and students. I don't know if that's really it. I think that <laughs> Uh, it, it's a tough gig and low pay, tough gig, high, extraordinarily high requirements to maintain, sustain being a, a teacher in grade school makes it less than ideal. Uh, so I really doubt that that's teachers unions are not the issue. <laughs> Well, and failing a uh, falling membership Silly. could be from basic things like teachers leaving the workforce during COVID. Yeah, they're aging out or something, or they want to, they've done a lot of teachers. They Well, no, that's true. A lot of teachers don't come out of college and go straight into teaching. They go into the, uh, a teacher has a career and then switches to teaching or they've gone through academia all the way to PhD, um, or they've done at least one master's and then drop back down into grade school because they feel that they want to make a change at the, the entry point and, and motivate and lead students into being better students and educated in their particular field. But it's really, really tough. <laughs> And it's a thankless job with very, very little pay compared to it. If teachers got paid at the level, at a, a piece of what their students learn and turn into later in life, every teacher would be a billionaire because they get, you know, 1% of the salary because everybody is learning something from an educator. It's not just through osmosis where they just live their life, la di da. So it's an absolutely thankless job. So, and it's much tougher than uh, college. <laughs> um, you know, grade school stuff is just so difficult. Um, but a lot of people manage to do it pretty well. So, anyway, let's keep on going. We've got one more article. And uh, this is one of my favorite subjects. It's over at Hometown Daily, Guatemala's first 3D printed tiny home. It combines 3D printing and tiny homes, which both I love. Um, it's a 
It's a 527 square foot house and was designed to resist earthquakes. It's a business inside, insider article. So of course it's going to have cool pictures. By the way, this is exactly what I talk about um, with people. When I try and promote 3D printing and 3D printing houses, it resists earthquakes, it resists flooding, it resists um, hurricanes, tornadoes. The, I mean, literally, these are brick shit houses. They they are all you if you do it right, you can close the window, close the doors or close the windows and the doors and they seal hermetically because a 3D printed house is it one contiguous block of cement. Come on now. Can't get much better than that. Right. Well, it certainly sounds very sturdy because of that. Yeah. And also quick to build. Yep. It can run 24 hours a day and you can have a whole bunch of these things depending on the size of the printer. So using C C O B O D's or Cobod's printer, 3D C P group and Progresso. Now, I don't think that's the soup company. Um, I think Progresso is spelled differently. Anyway, have built what they say is Guatemala's first 3D printed tiny home, the palm leaf roof topped unit, which obviously isn't going to survive a hurricane, um, was designed to resist 9.0 magnitude earthquakes. According to Kobod's uh, co-founder, the walls of the 527 square foot unit were printed in 26 hours over one week. Since this is their initial project, I can imagine that they were doing a lot of babysitting monitoring the structural capacity of this um but you could have gotten a lot further in a full day than 527 square feet Brittany chang over at businessinsider.com put the article together the thing about it is that it's designed to resist that 9.0 magnitude earthquake and it's because it is just one contiguous piece so not right here in the middle, apparently, but <laughs> right, um, we're missing a piece. <laughs> yeah, but it's not going to go anywhere, you know, unless this thing is just it uplifts right in the middle there. This thing is going to just sit there. Um, I think it's amazing. 527 square feet. Lots of windows. So over the last few years, more U.S. startups and real estate companies have been turning to 3D printing construction methods and progress is uh, happening fast this year the first batch of residents are expected to move into a first of its kind 100 home printed community near austin texas the one that i think we've about. actually featured that yes we did um but this particular article is about a guatemalan 3d printed tiny home though we'll take a look at the pictures here in a minute more recently in July, a Japanese company printed a 527 square foot tiny home prototype for about $37,300. That's not bad. Um, like I That's would want, good. yeah, I would want that and a whole bunch of land around it. That would be great. In Kenya, 14 trees is currently using this process to create a community of 52 homes. Pretty cool. So. In this particular uh, uh, design, it looks like it's a bunch of pillars for one of the halves of the building. Kind of looks like a yurt. Yeah, it does. With the shape and everything. Yeah, it does. And it would probably be even cheaper if it was. If you did nothing but put these down and then just drop the yurt around it. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about the expensive glass and all of that. Why am I watching this over here? Um, so it says it took longer than printing. It took longer than printing is what it says here. Using this tech, the new home's nine foot tall walls were printed in 26 hours over a week while completion on the rest of the home took longer than printing. Uh, Philip Lund Nielsen, Kobod's uh, co-founder told Insider to make it nine Point oh magnitude earthquake resistant according to his linkedin post the unit was topped with a traditional palm leaf based thatched roof ideal for seismic regions i guess because it's gonna flex and not collapse um 
but yeah, this is interesting. I think it would be stronger if it was more contiguous though, more connected. Right, exactly. Um, it's cool too, because it looks like it fits the environment. Like it doesn't just stand out or look like a, a brick or something. Mm, they don't have very many pictures of it. Interesting. So depending on the 3D tech that's being in, that is being deployed, when there are spans from one side to the other, they usually put metal plates down and then they can continue printing up on top and the metal plate bonds into the cement and it basically acts like a joint. Um, just like a, a door frame, all door frames have a header that connects the two sides. That's the equivalent. 3D printing, obviously cement has a problem in that there's no way to support creation of a roof. So you have to sit there and build a roof and then print on top of it, let it cure, make sure that it's structurally sound, reinforced, et cetera, and then remove the supports. Um, but in time, we will get all of that kind of workflow in place. Until then, you can prefab flat cement uh, roofs and then just set them in place. Um, and they do that all day long. Um, that's the stuff that makes up the layers between floors in, in, uh, uh, commercial buildings and stuff like that. Regular stick and nail homes have wood struts that run across long spans and stuff like that. But I prefer cement. It's more soundproof. It, it doesn't flex and, um, it doesn't creak it. I don't know. I just like the stability of it. Um, it does have a, a horrible carbon footprint, but I'm not cutting down trees to accomplish it at any rate. That is true. Plus you're withstanding an earthquake. So there is that. Yeah. And if the treadmill is upstairs, then everybody else is surviving an earthquake as I'm running. So, uh, the 3D printing system started around five hundred to $600,000. Um, but if you buy that from Kobod, then you can run around wherever you are and 3D print as long as you get the materials there. And some 3D printers allow you to take the material that's local right wherever it is. There was one project where they created a, um, a pond next to where they built the house out of the material that they dug the pond from. So all they did was mix it together with some binding agent, put it in the 3d printer, printed a house. And now they had a, a freshwater pond and a, a residence. So I thought it was brilliant. So there you go. Dun, dun, dun. So now I don't think I'm going to we'll be see more of these. I think so too. I'd love to see more in the United States, but building code and stuff like that, it's glacial in its adoption of new stuff. So, but that's it. I'm not going to move to Guatemala to enjoy that 3d printed house though. Sorry. So everybody let's get back into the party bus, drive all the way back down main street. Doo, doo, doo. And then we smack that sign, say, see you later hometown. Well, we'll take a look at these articles to see if there's anything we want to throw into the hopper right away. Hey, Sam Bankman Freed was found guilty of fraud. Shocker. Oh, I mean, I'm not that shocked, but I hadn't seen that headline yet. Yeah, it just came in 47 wow. minutes ago. Oh, I think that's a popular topic. Yeah, One, just a two, little. Three, four, five on the main page, <laughs> at least. <laughs> He hasn't gotten sentencing, but it appears that he faces 110 years in prison. My God. Oh, wow. uh, see, Wasn't now, he the one that was either advising somebody else or got advised of like how to do well in prison? Oh, I don't know if it was him, but usually really wealthy people have like a, uh, a prison uh, advisory committee showing you how to survive in prison. Okay. That's a, that's a ridiculous concept, but yeah. okay. I probably wouldn't survive five minutes. So, uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. It just keeps on going. <laughs> Look at that. Well, I mean, that's, 
it's been a big thing in the news during the trial and everything. I didn't follow the trial, but I remember we kept seeing headlines. Wow. Oh my gosh. It's still going. So many articles. <laughs> it's going and going. Yikes. Wow. Okay. Well, anyway, um, that's it. Let's go back up and uh, I'll just say good night to everybody. That's it. Hometown Daily for today is over. I'm Mayor Watt. That's hometown.com. And there's the ring of sentience for the sentient AI to say, I don't know. Bye bye. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with something funny, but I can't. <laughs> um, good night. Happy Thursday. We will see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern. 8 p.m. And then remember on Saturday and Sunday at 6 p.m. So uh, hopefully you'll want to hang out uh, then. I, I, we have events, um, so we'll probably be racing in at the last moment to, to do the show. But we'll be there, 6 p.m. <laughs> now I'm <laughs> questioning. Anyway, be sure to follow, subscribe over on YouTube, uh, uh, download the podcast, Follow us here on Twitch. That's really important, by the way. Leave a review over in the podcast. That's really, really important. It really helps out the show and helps out the podcast. Um, and if you leave a five-star review, I say what you say in your review. So go do it. There you go. Thanks a lot. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. The sentient AI just waved at everybody again. Only I see that part of it. Anyway, see you tomorrow, everybody. Bye-bye.